America from the Ground Up is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social, and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology. One of the costliest wars in American history is a war that most of us probably know very little about. If you saw it in the history books, it was called the French and Indian War. In Europe, it's called the Seven Years' War. But in reality, it's a global conflict fought between ancient European enemies for colonial supremacy. And the outcome would have major repercussions for the French, for the British, the colonials, and the Indians. And in this episode, the archaeological story that we uncover is going to be the real history of World War America. Starting at Quebec on the St. Lawrence, from Detroit and Mackinac on the Great Lakes, and down the Mississippi to New Orleans, New France formed a semicircle around the British colonies in North America. The British colonies suffered from mounting population pressure, and renewed hostilities in Europe only fed the fires of conflict with the French. In contrast to New France, with its loosely connected network of forts and trading centers, the British colonies along the Atlantic seaboard were more tightly administered, they were more heavily populated, and they were more hostile to native peoples. British immigration into the colonies was driven by the desire for land, but by the mid-18th century, the land along the eastern seaboard was becoming overcrowded. The solution, as far as the colonists were concerned, was the land to the west of the Appalachians. But there was a problem or rather two problems, New France and her native allies who occupied the land. The European population of New France was relatively small, but their alliances with native groups, especially in the Great Lakes region, helped to tip the balance of power in their favor. I asked Joe Brandau to help me understand the relationship. So the French population in North America was maybe a tenth of the 13 colonies in, in the U.S. Right, it's maybe 70,000 or something. At the end of the French regime. Okay. In the early period when this fort was founded, it was first established in the 1690s, there couldn't have been much more than 15,000 people, if that. The census, in, the census in 1663, I think, was for around 10,000. I could be wrong. Um, so very small numbers. So they relied on good relationship with the Indians. There were never more than 45, 50 people here year-round. The network of rivers and lakes that connected New France to the interior was home to a series of forts that were flashpoints where the French, British, and Native Americans clashed. Lake Champlain cuts through the heart of North America, connecting the interior to the Atlantic. I traveled there to see Andy Beaupre, an archaeologist who studies how people manipulate places in the landscape to create social power. Andy, the role of Lake Champlain in the Seven Years' War is really central. What can you tell me about the sites and the forts along that that are going to put it in a landscape perspective? Well, you have this inland waterway here. I mean, you have the Lake Champlain tying down through to Lake George and over into the Hudson. And you have that all the way back to the St. Lawrence in, in Montreal. And so creating that inland way around the English colonies that are really kind of coastal bound here, and the French have a, an incursion of these forts that actually go and stop here at, uh, at Crown Point and then a little bit further down uh, to Ticonderoga. And that's as far really as, as far south as the French get. But they had this fortified string that goes all the way back to Montreal. They had three of these across the continent, one here, 
one over that came off the Great Lakes and down into what's now Pittsburgh at Fort Duquesne, and then another one that split after the Acadian expulsion that split New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So you had a French line of defense there at Beauséjour and Fort Gaspareau. So you had this kind of French incursion and pushing and kind of hemming in the British colonies in this area. It became really important, these what we call clashes along border zones. I'm here in modern Pittsburgh at the site that was a flashpoint where the French, British, and competing native interests collided and a war ignited at one of those contended border zones. To further check British advances, the French built a string of forts from Lake Erie to the Fork of the Ohio River here in modern Pittsburgh. In 1755, the French erected a fort here named after the Governor General, the Marquis Duquesne. The British, alarmed by French moves, sent an emissary to demand the French withdraw. History remembers him as the father of our country, but in 1754, he was an inexperienced Virginia militia colonel named George Washington who accidentally started a war. Washington's mission ended in failure and an embarrassing surrender at Fort Necessity. Determined to dislodge the French from the Ohio River Valley, the British sent more than 1,500 troops and militia under the command of General Edward Braddock to Virginia. Braddock and his aides, including a young Colonel Washington, set out across the wilderness to Fort Duquesne in early 1755. Today, this outline on the ground is all that's left of the French Fort Duquesne. But in July of 1755, the battle that was fought here between the English and the French was by all accounts a disaster for the English. The fighting was so fierce, it was unlike anything that the English or the French would have seen on the battlefields of Europe. By the end of 1755, it appeared as though the Franco-Indian Alliance was in firm control of the interior of North America. Each power wanted the Indians on their side for the manpower and the military advantage that, that they might get. The French absolutely needed it. Without them, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't survive. Indians were part of almost every major French military uh, incursion. Uh, there was a theory that for a long time that in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War in America, yeah. that it, this was the, the, first, the, the first time that, you know, that there was the French succeeded because the, in large in our battle because they used Indian uh, fighting techniques. In reality, this, this was a fairly conventional war. But in the early period, it was this kind of guerrilla warfare blend, and the French were quite successful. For the British, the Iroquois Confederacy, which was located in upstate New York and the Ohio Valley, largely stayed neutral in the conflict. That is, until later British victories spurred them to get off the fence. It's impossible to generalize about Native American foreign policy. And that's because there are so many competing alliances and individual groups pursuing their own best interests, whether it's to ally with one another or with various European factions. The French forts along the inland water highways were key nodal points in the fur trade network. But what was their role militarily, and why did the French choose to build them there in the first place? At Fort St. John sur Richelieu, not far from Montreal, I talked with Andy about the early French forts there. So Andy, today the fort is the Royal Military College of St. John. That's right. Actually, it's analogous to uh, Canada's West Point. All the young officer cadets come here to train. Andy and his team have excavated a number of sites at the fort over the last few years, so I asked him to tell me more about the archaeological evidence for the earliest fort. Well, the earliest documentary evidence we have, we know that the Carillon Salier Regiment in 1666, actually 6566, built a string of forts from the St. Lawrence River all the way down into Lake Champlain. And one of those forts was right here. It was built in 1666, and it's what we call the first Fort Saint-Jean. Now, Archaeologically, uh, we believe we've recovered uh, a piece of that. It's possibly dated to that, uh, just over to my left here. And so uh, in the past, we were able to um, recover that piece. And uh, it's stratigraphically similar, but we didn't get a firm date. It's just a post-mold stain. Now, what would the fort have been shaped like? How would it have looked? Well, it's another really good question. The series of five forts that was built each of them was built a little bit differently according to the historical documentation. So we don't have an exact picture, we don't actually have a picture at all of what the fort exactly looks like. But we're estimating, based on the other forts, that it was a square base, what we call bastions, or kind of pointy stars that come right, out of the corner. Andy, archaeology is also, on one level, the study of people. You know, it's not just data. So what do we have archaeologically that's telling us about the people who lived here and what they're doing? In this case, 
a piece of bar shot was recovered from the excavation. And we were able to recover that and find out that it was actually built by the blacksmith, a man who was stationed here at St. Jean and lived his life here with his family. We were able to make an artifact connection to a person, a historical personage in the past. I wanted to find out what bar shot was used for, so I met with Adam Kane from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum to learn more. We have one that's pretty well intact, and then this is half of it because it's been broken, and it's clearly been broken and bent right. when it, uh, during the impact of, of hitting it. So these are specific naval ordinances, and they are designed, they are loaded into a cannon, just like a cannonball, mm -hmm. but as they are shot out, it covers more of a surface area as it spins, and as it does that, it takes out the rigging of ships. Today, the remains of the French Fort St. Frederick are at the foot of the modern bridge connecting Vermont and New York. There, you can still see the fort's outline in the landscape. I met with retired New York State archaeologist Paul Huey and asked him about the fort. Well, the fort was constructed in 1734 by the French to demonstrate their authority and jurisdiction over this area. Behind you here is the location of the citadel, or redoubt, which was a central stronghold within the French fort. It was meant as a, a, a last resort. It had its own separate drawbridge and moat around it. It was meant to impress the Indians, especially. The fort was designed not to resist artillery because the French did not believe the British, who were the enemy at that time, would ever get artillery this far north to attack. Places like Fort St. Frederick and the later British Fort Crown Point were more effective as symbols of power than they were militarily. I wanted to see what Andy thought about them. It was a very symbolic place. It was a large four-story keep that looked north onto the lake, north toward home, toward the protected idea of New France, was to the north of this point. And the same thing when you look at Saint-Jean. Saint-Jean was built at a strategic point on rapids. But it wasn't the most defendable position in the area. They encroached further to the south than the British then fortified down around Lake George. You get William Henry, you get Fort Edward, Rogers Island, and then you have that kind of a border zone, that clash, where these two empires come together. And then, as the Seven Years' War comes to an end and New France, the southern forts of New France, fall, the British just kind of take over and leapfrog one by one all the way back to Illinois, Saint-Jean, and on to Montreal and Quebec City eventually. From Crown Point, I headed south through New York State towards Fort Carillon, later Ticonderoga, where I was due to meet with Chris Fox, curator of archaeology at the fort. Here on the southern end of Lake Champlain, Fort Carillon was a French stronghold that initially withstood the massive attack by General Abercrombie. So Chris, we're right here where the river empties into Lake Champlain, and the fort is right on top of that. Is there some significance in the, uh, in the geography and topography of the area? Very much so. Controlling the waterways was everything to the armies that, that occupied Ticonderoga. The fort was in fact built here to protect the outlet of the Lachute River, which is actually the beginning of the portage, the overland short, maybe two mile portage between Lake Champlain in front of us and Lake George just on the other side of the mountain there. But the difference here is that Lake George on the other side of Mount Defiance is about 220 feet higher in elevation than Champlain. So it's not just simply, it's not as easy as just getting in the boat and following the river down to the lake. You've got to haul them over land down a, what I'm sure in the 18th century was a very rough, probably at times very muddy road to get them into the lake. But the important thing is that the fort is protecting access to the portage. And when you can control these portage points on this really water highway connecting New York and New France, you can control everything. I left Chris and traveled south to Fort William Henry, where I met with archaeologist Dr. David Starbuck. David has spent much of his career excavating colonial era sites in the region. I wanted to know more about the archaeological evidence at the fort, so I asked David if the 1950s reconstruction had hampered current excavations there. They built most of the buildings just a little bit over. So for modern archaeology, we can still dig the West Barracks. We can still dig the East Barracks because each reconstruction is about 10 feet over from the original. The that's cellars what, are there. That's what we've got right here. This is the cellar of the East Barracks. There probably was a blacksmith shop right about here. There's a destroyed barracks far place right here. If the reconstruction had been put on top of this, we couldn't do archaeology anymore. David and I left William Henry and traveled to another site he's working to preserve, 
So David, we're here today on Rogers Island, which is the location of one of the most important British forts in the 18th century. What can you tell me about this, uh, this site and its role in American history? Here in Northern New York State, we had the Battle of Lake George in 1755. It was right after that famous battle that two British forts were built. One was here in Fort Edward on the Hudson River. The other fort was on Lake George at Fort William Henry. Here on the Hudson River, we had an encampment of British soldiers and American provincial soldiers that totaled at least 15 or 16,000 men. I swear that most Americans, the only story they remember from the French and Indian War is the last the Mohegan story. And the story begins here in Fort Edward. Hawkeye and his companions are about to leave Fort Edward and travel through the forest to get up there to Fort William Henry. Modern archaeology is more than just digging a hole in the ground, and science is helping us to preserve the important pieces of our past, including Fort Edward and Rogers Island. Chris Sabick from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum told me how he's working to preserve timbers recovered from the Fort Edward site. Chris, we're out here in the glamorous shed facility at uh, the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, but in reality, this is an incredibly sophisticated operation, and you guys have one of the largest wood preservation tanks uh, if not in the United States, certainly in the region. That's true. We have this large purpose-built tank. It's about six feet wide and 21 feet long. And what's the project that we're actually looking at here in the tank today? Sure. We're conserving some of uh, some very large timbers from uh, Fort Edward, New York, um, okay. the, the actual fort that was located in what is now the town of Fort Edward. And what period is that fort again? Uh, the fort was principally built during the French and Indian War, so 1750s. And then how does it end up here and what's going to happen to sure. it? Sure, these were found uh, basically sticking out of the river bank and into the water. So they were okay. saturated for their entire time uh, on site, um, which is why they needed this special level of treatment. Water lug wood in particular is very fragile when it's removed from that right. water. Despite the loss of Fort William Henry, 1758 marked a turning point in the war for the British. With the rise to political prominence of William Pitt the Elder, British war strategy changed. Pitt shifted forces away from Europe and sent them to America, where he hoped to overwhelm the numerically inferior French colony. In relatively short order, the British sent more than 20,000 troops and massive naval reinforcements into the American theater. This was a tremendously expensive undertaking, and British attempts to recoup those costs would have implications for colonial relations in the decades to come. On Pitt's orders, the British captured Fort Duquesne, Carillon, and Louisbourg, effectively cutting off French access to the interior. While the war raged in the north, Fearing the British would disrupt trade on the Mississippi River, French military engineers built Fort de Chartres on the banks of the river to protect access to New Orleans. Fort de Chartres is about an hour south of St. Louis, and even today, this, this place feels really remote. Imagine you're a French soldier from Paris in the 1750s out here on the frontier. This place must have felt like the edge of the world. Today, the reconstructed stone walls of the fort rise out of the Mississippi bottomland like a vision from a romantic dream. But, like Fort Carillon, it may be a fanciful one. It's likely that the original fortress had walls of wood on stone foundations. After the collapse of the French frontier firewall in 1758, the British turned their attentions to the heart of French colonial power in North America, Quebec and Montreal. The French losses at Niagara in July of 1759, along with their defeat here on the Plains of Abraham at Quebec in September of that year, meant that they had lost control of the inland waterways and could no longer supply their forts in the interior. With the French surrender of Montreal in September of 1760, their power in North America was broken. Mm -hmm. 
When news of the French surrender at Montreal reached the commander here at Colonial Michilimackinac, he immediately abandoned his post and scuppered off to New Orleans in order to avoid being captured by the British. Despite the British victories at Quebec and Montreal and their defeat of the hated French, British control of the interior of North America was by no means assured. In reality, while they had defeated one half of the Franco-Indian alliance, in North America at least, that was the weaker half. Here in the Great Lakes, where the Franco-Indian alliance was strongest, resistance continued well after the defeat of the French. Despite their victories on the battlefield, the British had yet to solve the question of what to do with the native inhabitants of their newly conquered territory. For their part, the Native Americans viewed a British victory not as a conquest, but merely as the emergence of a new trading partner. British misunderstanding of this dynamic would ultimately cost them their American colonies. Things didn't start off well with the British appointment of Lord Geoffrey Amherst as Governor General in 1760. The chief point of contention was Amherst's rigid application of Crown policy, and particularly hated by the Native Americans was his decision to abandon the French policy of gift giving, including food, alcohol, and firearms. Joe and I talked about the social role of gift giving in Native society and why the British were so determined to end the French practice of it. And, and Britain has gone to a great deal of expense to, to try and, and drive the, the French from North America, and they're trying to cut back on the, on the expenses of maintaining the empire, so they just eliminate the, uh, the gift giving. And for, and for the natives, this was a sign of disrespect. Uh, it meant that the former um, uh, consensual relationship that they had and interdependent relationship that they had was no longer uh, in, in play, and it was obvious from the way they were treated, and this was both symbolic and real. Uh, it was symbolic in the sense that it marked the change in the way things happened, but it also meant uh, a significant cutoff in supplies. Weapons were exchanged, um, trade goods were provided. Eric Hemingway gave me some valuable insight into the importance of gift giving in Anishinaabek culture. At this time, when somebody took a life from your family, you could be, have this resolved in two ways. One, the people who took the life would come and give you gifts, and that's called covering the dead. Sure. And the French did this, and that would smooth over things. But if they didn't cover the dead, then you would go and get revenge. From the American, and I would even say the British perspective towards indigenous peoples in North America, they were seen as subhuman, mm. and that's my opinion. That you would treat these people, you de dehumanize them, and you don't see them as equals, and so you don't feel this respect or this need to pay these gifts or make amends for these atrocities that are happening because you don't see them as equals. Native resentment at British abuses boiled over into open conflict. History remembers this as Pontiac's War, and it began here in Michigan at Colonial Michilimackinac. There was a main orchestrator by the name of Pontiac, and a lot of people know the name Pontiac from cars, from towns and streets and so on and so forth, but they, I don't think there's a, a realization that this was an Odawa warrior who was leading a mass resistance to British incursion onto native lands. And there's some debate on whether Pontiac was, you know, the, the ringleader of this or he was just the most prominent leader. But without a doubt that the indigenous people of the Great Lakes were standing up for their rights. They were standing up to, you know, the British coming onto their lands and a, a large battle took place right here at Fort Mitchell Mackinac between the British and s visiting Sauk warriors and Ojibwe. And it's very interesting because this was one of the largest battles of Pontiac's war. They took a large fort without the use of any firearms. They used a, a ruse uh, through a game of lacrosse, what we call Bagataway. The, the vast majority of um, native forces in 1763 were against the British. Um, there was no doubt about it. There was very few tribes siding with the British after they took control of all the French forts. Um, and the success was pretty amazing. You know, we, we look at this as a very proud moment in Anishinaabek history, that we were able to literally expel, you know, the, the preeminent empire of the time, the British, from our homelands. We took nine of 13 forts in the Great Lakes. For the native peoples, they exchanged a dependable, if not predictable, ally for a fussy, ill-tempered British aristocracy that was utterly disinterested in seeing them as anything other than savages. The British tone deafness led to unrest both in the colonies and out on the frontier. They tried to undo some of the damage with the Indians with the Proclamation of 1763 when they agreed to restrict expansion west of the Appalachian Mountains. 
The restrictions enraged the American colonists, and the British made matters worse when they decided to recoup the expense of their global war through taxation. Ultimately, British victory in America was a hollow one. The end result was that no one in North America was particularly happy with the status quo, and this unrest would lead to the American Revolution within 10 years. Join us next time as we dig into the archaeological history of the American Revolution from the ground up. Check out the America from the Ground Up website for crew blogs, behind the scenes photographs, and more. America from the Ground Up is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology.